Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a terrible day. I'm having a terrible day here. Um, I wanted to make this guide about heist in Path of Exile. Um, other people have made guides about heist before, and they're they're quite good. But I had a, a different take on a few things. Um, I'm a player that prim plays a lot of heist in Path of Exile when I play Path of Exile, which is not all the time. I'm not like the most prolific player in the world or anything, but I just wanted to put out some some ideas for the, the, the stuff in Path of Exile that's made me money, which is most heavily heist. So, why would you run heist? Uh, the reason that I run heist is to generate a lot of currency and a lot of valuable rewards. There are three types of rewards that are particularly valuable in Heist. One of them is divination cards. You're going to get a lot of stacked decks and you're going to open a lot of stacked decks and a lot of those stacked decks are going to have garbage but some of them might have very valuable divination cards. I would recommend as a heist runner to open your stack decks rather than sell them there's just going to be so many of them you're going to be selling them for days and days and days it's just easier if you open them yourself if you don't want to then take additional variants on opening certain cards like the void feel free to sell the void specifically and and other cards that, that are variants that you don't want to deal with but open your stack decks and take stock of the most valuable cards that you get um, another thing that you can get from heists that's very valuable are unusual gems when you run unusual gem blueprints you're going to get a choice of unusual gems and sometimes you might just get garbage but at other times you'll get some gems that are really quite valuable and this is probably the single biggest thing that I've done to make money is farm and sell unusual gems uh, that I get from blueprints this can be very profitable to do um, I don't know so well what the difference is in selling unusual gems and, and standard and league obviously the standard prices are going to be higher or uh, I have no idea what the prices are in hardcore. I don't know if the prices are in in different times of the league. It, I think there are probably it's probably the case that early on in the league people will not be able to buy your unusual gems for very much because they just haven't farmed the currency yet. Um, so this might be a thing that doesn't. I I don't try and hurry. I, I've never tried to hurry and get very well set up very quickly in the league. So this is not what I do with Heist, but I do um, farm a lot of unusual gems and sell a lot of these unusual gems for pretty good, pretty good money. Every unusual gem that I sell almost is, is uh, brought up to 2020 and then I corrupt them myself and hope that they get to 2120 and I try and sell the result, whatever it is. Um, a lot of different types of, of gems will still sell, even if they do not get to 2120, even if they, they get bricked and go to a lower quality than 20. Uh, that's all That's all okay. These are risks that, that you take when you do lots of gems. Uh, this means that I have a, all, all the time I have gems leveling up on my uh, back bar. One thing that I do to facilitate this, if you don't know this trick, you can have nine gems on your back bar if you have a Maloney's mechanism and then you have a, a bow where that has six sockets and then you have three more sockets in Maloney's mechanism. Um, so this is this can be a very useful trick uh, as long as you have the dexterity to equip this bow um, and stuff like that. And as you can see, I have all of these white socketed for my setup, which you don't have to do if you just have a because if you always have gems if you have a reasonable mix of sockets then you'll always have gems of one color or another and you'll be able to get all of those gems leveled up eventually if you don't want to take the expense of having of, of of making these white sockets yourself or or crafting them yourself and um the third reason to farm heist 
is to get currency. This is immensely facilitated if you have a trinket that converts chaos orbs into divines or regal orbs into divines. I have a, a trinket here that converts chaos into divines. Um, this is extremely expensive. Slightly less expensive and possible to farm yourself, I actually farmed this one the other day, is a trinket like this that converts regal orbs into divines. And the, the one that converts chaos orbs into, a, into divines, this is an extremely rare drop trinket. The, the weight on this mod is one out of all of the different mods that can drop. There's a, 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 a it takes the, the weight of the whole pool and there's only one, one weight that it will drop as either chaos to divine or chaos to um, exalts, which you don't want chaos to exalts. That's not, not very good. You want chaos to divine. Um, chaos to exalts, if you do get it, you know, that's not terrible. You should pick that trinket and sell it, but you you really want the one that gives divines that'll be much more lucrative uh, so this will cost in the order of 100 divines this will cost in the order of a divine um, and as i said if you run enough of these you might find this yourself i farmed this one the other day uh two percent chance in heists for regal orbs to drop as divines instead um, either one of these, whichever one you take, if you can afford the Chaos one, which I don't know how much better the Chaos one is anyway, because Regals don't drop that much less often than Chaos to begin with, um, you will be tr wanting to farm as many heists as possible, opening as many small boxes and currency boxes as possible to get as many Divines as possible. And you also want to duplicate as many of your currency drops as possible in order to maximize the number of divines that you can get with these items so all three of those are, are excellent rewards in heists uh, in addition to unusual gems there are also some other blueprint types um, there are four blueprint types one of them is unusual gems the next most valuable type of blueprint probably is replica items which have a chance to give you a bunch of experimented bases or replica items uh many of the experimented bases are bad some of them will be pretty good and will sell well um many of the replica items are bad but you also have a chance of getting things like replica ferals fur or replica alberon's warpath very valuable items um Play, doing these is a little, little bit of, of uh, playing the lottery, but you, you have a chance of getting a bunch of, of intermediate replica items that are decent and will be able to sell for a number of chaos at least. Um, thief trinket blueprints are also a little bit playing the lottery because you'll either get an outstanding thief trinket, like this one cost that I've listed here for three divines, or one that costs 100 divines with chaos to divines but you're playing the lottery you're very unlikely to, to get these these rewards more likely you'll get bad trinkets that you don't want to take and then instead of that you'll take six chaos which is okay i it's not necessarily what you want to take six chaos but if you have the rogue markers and you're also doing heists for the the other rewards and trying to get divines from opening all of the the small heist boxes and getting as much many currency and divine boxes as you possibly can um then you know you'll settle for having six chaos you'd rather have six chaos than not have six chaos coming out of a a thief's trinket heist the fourth blueprint type enchanted armaments is definitely the worst blueprint type i should say that uh, you should pay attention to the item level of the blueprints. The, the unusual gems will always drop unusual gems. As long as you're running an item level 70 plus blueprint, um, which almost all the blueprints you'll be running will be, then it'll drop any unusual gem, no problem. Um, but the other ones will drop trinkets or items, uh, like rare items, high space items, that are not more than two levels higher than the item level of your blueprint maybe three levels higher possibly 
because I think I have seen uh, I level 86 gear drop sometimes in some heists. Um, but that being said, if you want a a trinket with this mod of uh, cast orbs have a chance to drop as divines, you can only get that on an item level 83 uh, heist trinket. So just keep that in mind. Enchanted armaments do not have any chance to drop anything but rare items with unusual enchantments. Um, and they're always armor. Actually, they, no, they're also weapons. Armor and weapons. Um, these are very strange. And they're difficult to sell. And I think I have some that I can show here. 8% increased explicit resistance modifier magnitudes. So these resistance mods that rolled on these items, as you can see, it's telling you are increased by 8% due to this enchantment. The problem is you need to, this needs to drop on a base that's good enough for, for it to actually be worth selling. And many of the bases that you get will not be worth selling. And all of the bases that you get will not be worth selling if they're not at least item level 84. So you should never run an, an Enchanted Armaments contract that's less than item level 84. You'll never get anything good out of it. Um, and in general, if you want to skip the Enchanted Armaments contracts, I generally skip them. I don't or I don't run, run those blueprints very often. Um... The other three types of blueprints are a lot better than enchanted armaments, which is unfortunate because enchanted armaments are the most likely blueprints to drop. You have a one-third chance of a blueprint being an enchanted armaments blueprint because there are three tile sets that have enchanted armaments and two tile sets for all of the other types of blueprints. Uh, the most valuable blueprint to run clearly is the unusual gems, and then the other two types, the thief trinket and the replicas, are, are ones that if you have... The, the extra the blueprints to do them and the extra rogue markers it's probably more lucrative for you to run them yourself than it is to try and sell those blueprints because people don't really want to buy those blueprints they want to buy unusual gems blueprints for obvious reasons and you're not going to want to sell the unusual gem blueprints if you run heist at all you want to run those yourself and and sell the and make a lot of profit so why do we run heist? We run currency with, with our juice trinkets. We get lots of div cards and we run unusual gems. And then you can also run the other types of blueprints too if you want. So let's get started with this question. What contract types are the best for making money and what contract types should we avoid? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to understand what makes the different contract types different. It, it turns out that there are four features, four features that make different contract types different. Um, one of those features is the contracts uh, can roll on different tile sets. So there are nine different contract types in the game and there are nine different tile sets. And some contracts cannot roll on certain tile sets. These aren't very constrained. I think all of the tile sets have between five and seven contracts that they can can uh could roll on that tile set for instance the bunker uh heist location has seven different contract types that it can roll it can't roll deception or brute force and it can roll the other seven contract types and so on for the other contract types so there's not very much much constraint there are a lot of different contracts that can roll on each of the different tile sets even if they're not 100% of the contracts can't roll on 100% of the tile sets. Um, I don't really care about the difference between tile sets. Some of the tile sets might be slightly longer than others and they have different different kinds of enemies. Uh, the most important kind of enemy that, that makes a difference to me is the presence, the, how likely it, the alert totems, that the I think they're like watcher totems or something like that, that when you walk next to them, if you stand next to them too long, they will burst and increase the alert level and those are very annoying but um overall i don't don't even care about the tile set i don't consider a tile set an important factor in any aspect of, of evaluating which contracts are better um, the second feature that makes the different contract types different is the nature of the in-game job so the, the in-game job when you have the, the heist assistant uh 
or rogue, um, perform a job takes a certain amount of time. And some of these jobs, all of the jobs will take time, but some of them are different in, in two ways. One of them is that the job might have a long animation time. For instance, agility and demolition have an animation time that are unskippable after the actual job time. And the job time is affected by job speed modifiers, but the animation time is not. You simply have to sit and wait for the animation. So those, those contracts with like agility and demolition with long animations are slightly worse because they have long animations that you have to, to sit there and wait for. The other way in which job types matter is because some of the jobs can be skippable. Um, they might be dangerous to be to, if you skip them, but you could skip them and simply survive the dangerous circumstance. Um, there are four jobs that are like this, which are ag agility, uh, counter thumb, trap disarmament, and engineering. The engineering ones are usually very minor and very easy to skip. The other three, if your character is not extremely durable, um, or if you're doing something like playing in hardcore, you will not want to skip those jobs. Just do the job to be safe. Uh, we don't want to die in heist more than more than more than ever. We never want to die in heist. Um, and then, of course, deception has a special feature where deception does not create any new new jobs after lockdown. Whereas all of the other contract types do have jobs after lockdown, so Deception will be able to run a little bit more quickly because there are no jobs after lockdown. And that could also help you survive because there are no jobs after lockdown. You simply have to run through the map. You do not have to bother killing anything. Whereas you may need to, to turn around and, and start killing things and stay in one place, which may make you slightly vulnerable. Uh, while your assistant does the job, your trap disarmament job to open the door and get out of the, the heist. Um, overall, the nature of the in-game job is not very important to me. It's only of very minor importance in evaluating which contract types are good. And that leaves the other two features of different contract types, which are very important in terms of evaluating how good the contract is. And those are the types of reward rooms that can spawn in the contract and which heist assistants uh, can go on a particular contract. So if you like currency reward rooms, and if you like Gianna as a heist assistant, then those are, those are a, a very good reward room type and a very good heist assistant. You're going to favor those contracts that have those features. And you can rank those features in terms of which are the best reward types and which are the best assistants. And those are tasks that I'm going to undertake now. All right, so let's talk about reward rooms. All heists have reward rooms that can have one or two large reward chests in them. They also have a bunch of small reward chests, which have random loot uh, littered throughout the heist. And all of opening all of these reward boxes increases your alert level. So it is helpful to know which are the best reward rooms in order to not randomly open everything because you only have so much alert level to work with. So let's talk about what types of rewards are good and what type of rewards are not good. Uh, we have our handy tier list for this purpose. So let's just put some stuff in the list that's really bad. Talismans are really bad. I don't know why talismans are in the game. Unique items, you're very likely to get garbage, weapons and, and armor. Uh, these are all really bad, and I probably didn't need to explain them. Uh, let's put prophecies in the F tier because prophecies are no longer in the game. So, uh, you know, whatever, prophecies aren't here. And then uh, jewelry is also really bad. Maybe some people like to open jewelry boxes just because they can have jewels and, and you can identify jewelry, rare, rare jewelry quickly, and maybe the rare jewelry is good and maybe it takes up no space if it is good. Um, I, I don't open jewelry boxes. Uh, all of these are boxes that I ignore basically 100% of the time, even if I have the alert level to open them. Not worth the time to open. <clears throat> so the remaining, the remaining boxes are ones that I could open. And of these, I, Abyss is probably the worst. Uh, 
abyss is just very likely to get you bad abyss jewels that aren't very high uh, item level. So the, the highest item level of contract that you can have is a level 83 contract or blueprint. That means that the abyss jewels that will come out of the reward chests, because these are coming from reward chests, are always going to be the item level of the contract, which is 83 at most. And rare abyss jewels from item level 83 aren't very good. Another reward type that is not very good is Blight. <clears throat> um, the most useful thing that Blight boxes will give you is uh, Blight enchanted maps. These are not Blighted maps. They're just maps with a Blight enchantment on them. And they're going to be of a random tier. So maybe there will be like a tier 15 or 16 map that you feel like running. But maybe it'll be like a tier 4 map with a Blight enchantment that you really don't care about. Um... Whether or not you want to run a tier 4 map with a Blight enchantment just to do the Blight. Well, uh, you know, a tier 4 Blight map is not going to... Can't... Um, give as good rewards as higher tier Blight encounters. Um, although if you take the, the, the Atlas passive that has the Blight bosses drop anointed jewelry, it can certainly drop those. But almost all of the time, the Blight boxes are just going to drop low oils. And they're, they're worthless. There's really very, very low chance of you getting anything of use in a Blight box. <clears throat> I still tend to open these if I uh, have extra alert level that I'm not using for anything else. All of the small boxes are finished and I have more alert level. That I can open blight, blight boxes with, sure, sure thing. So let's move on. The rest of these are all a little bit better. I will put some stuff in the C tier. Breach boxes have been nerfed uh, in 321, as all of Breach has been nerfed very heavily. And the Breach boxes really don't give many splinters at all. They'll give you like one or two or maybe three splinters and that's it. It's just very underwhelming. They might give you scarabs, which are useful. Breach was nerfed so hard in 321 that I feel personally like it's incredibly unrewarding. It feels terrible to do any kind of Breach content. But that being said, the splinters being rarer makes them a little bit more valuable, perhaps. Um... I don't prioritize the breach boxes. Another box type that I do not prioritize is legion boxes. These boxes are likely to give you uh, legion splinters, which are not very valuable, and incubators. And if you're like me, incubators are really annoying. I just hate fiddling with the incubators. Sometimes they can be of some value but I don't really understand why incubators are in the game, making you just delay uh, your reward until some future time. That seems very silly to me. I'd just rather have the reward instantly, and I, I, I don't enjoy messing around with incubators. So, for that reason, I put them in the C tier. The rewards, I don't think, are tremendously of great value to make me prefer them more. So that's it for the C tier. I'm just going to put a bunch of things in the B tier that are okay. I'm not mad to pick up these reward boxes, but they're really not the most valuable things in the world. I'm not mad to pick up essences, but the the, the essences that come in, uh, in heists are usually uh whaling i think is the correct essence level they're not the top two levels of essence um so they're not really worth that all that much maybe one chaos per essence um at that tier or maybe less um the most valuable thing you can get in the essence boxes is remnant of corruption which will if you if you open a lot of essence boxes you will get a bunch of remnant of corruption and those are are reasonably useful. 
Um, but that being said, the, the, just the, the, the overall value of the essence boxes is not that high. Another box type that the overall value is not that high is map fragments. You're going to get a lot of offering to the goddess. You're going to get a lot of sacrifices, like sacrifice at dawn, sacrifice at dusk. Um, you can get some higher things in here. You can get mortal fragments, but the, just the average value of this box type is not, not so, not so great. I'm going to put ahead of these two box types, uh, fossils. Fossils are, are okay. Um, again, the average value is not outstanding, but I'm not mad to pick up some fossils of, of you know, moderate value, a couple, couple of chaos out of a box and a couple of fossils. The, the really good fossil types don't tend to drop, although I think that um, I think it's sanctified fossil uh, does drop out of these boxes sometimes, which is a bit more valuable than some of the other fossils. Overall, the fossils pretty solid, solidly in B tier. You could make a case to move fossils up one tier here, but I'm not, I don't think the value of fossils, maybe I'm a bit biased in, in saying this, but I don't think the value of fossils is incredibly high. And another box type that is not incredibly high, Harbinger. Uh, most of the time when you get Harbinger, you're going to get a bunch of little shards like chaos shards that aren't really very valuable um, but you can also get some things in harbinger shards that are more useful which are include annulment shards ancient orbs and i'm not sure if you can actually get fracturing shards from the, the harbinger boxes in heist because i've never gotten one but maybe you can um and the, certainly i've never gotten a mirror shard from a, a, a heist harbinger box before but maybe you can maybe it's possible I'm not sure. Most of the time, the value of these these boxes isn't so high, but it's okay. Like I'm, these are all all boxes that I I, I don't mind in terms of of their overall value. Another B tier box that's just not all that valuable is Delirium. Um, this might be significantly more valuable if you like running Delirious maps. I'm not sure how. Because these are going to be like some maps that could have free good delirium orbs on them. And I, uh, I I don't think that you can change the enchantments. I think you can change a delirium orb to another stack of delirium orbs in Harvest Crafting. But this, these, ma these are maps that already have the enchantments on them. And I don't think you can modify them. Um, although you can add more, more delirium onto them. Um, they're also maps of a random tier. So you might get a tier 15 Delirious map, or you might get a tier 3 Delirious map that you don't end up caring about. And they're also a random reward. So you might get a tier 15 Delirious map with a currency reward on it, and a divination reward on it, um, that you want to run. And you might get a tier 3 20% Delirious map with a weapons reward on it that you don't care about at all. Um, so that being said, I think that some of the Delirious maps that come out of here will be quite useful uh the delirious boxes also drop cluster jewels which are all eye level 83 which limits them but some of the cluster 80 jewels are still useful at eye level 83 and simulacrum splinters so you're gonna get a lot of that that, that stuff um, i think this is better if you if you want to run these delirious maps um if you don't then Maybe Delirium doesn't even deserve to be in B. I'm not sure. I'd, either way, it's it's sort of of moderate value. I'm not unhappy to open a Delirious box, uh, pick up Simulacrum Splinters and Cluster Jewels that might roll well. Um, but overall, not prioritizing Delirium reward boxes here. And I'm a little bit unsure about where to place Metamorph. I'm going to place Metamorph in Tier A, but very reasonably it could be in Tier B. One of the reasons for this is just because this is a good source of catalysts, and there are not many other sources of catalysts in the game if you don't actually run Metamorphs, and Metamorphs feel very unrewarding to, to, to allocate on your passive. I've done it, and I just ended up not, uh, not running Metamorphs anymore on my passive tree um, because... It didn't feel good, especially killing the metamorphs in in uh, from the samples in, in Tain's laboratory doesn't feel good at all. 
So other sources of metamorphs, or other sources of catalysts, are a good way to farm catalysts, and I personally like having catalysts. Um, but that being said, maybe this should be in the B tier here. I realize that this isn't the most highest value reward box either, um, but it's okay. You'll get a couple of catalysts. It's going to be a couple of chaos. Um, depending on which catalyst, it might be more than a couple of chaos if you, you get some good catalysts out of the, the, the metamorph boxes. So that leaves us with these reward types left. Random maps, gems, currency, and divination cards. I'm going to put the maps in tier A. Um, this is very good for map sustain in a league. Um, I'm not really concerned with map sustain, but if you need map sustain, you can definitely get a lot of maps from these boxes. But I think the most valuable thing to come from these boxes is not just any maps, but rather special maps. Um, you can get uh, influenced maps or um, Shaper or Elder Guardian maps from these, and, and those are always valuable that will help you farm uh, for those endgame bosses and also help you farm Maven Fragments. So for that reason, maps will go into Tier A. And then another thing that will go into Tier A is the random boxes, which will just give you any rewards, which are more likely to be currency, and currency is good. I don't know what the composition of random boxes is exactly, um, but I think it's more weighted to be currency than lots of other things. Although I think that any of the other reward types from the, the any other box can drop in random boxes, um, but they usually contain a lot of currency. So that leaves us with gems, currency, and divination cards. And I'm going to put all of these into the S tier. And divination cards and currency, I think, are, are things that people understand to be in the S tier. Um, and I think that gems is a reward type that people might be more likely to overlook. Divination cards, one of the reasons you do heists, get a ton of stack decks. And... In your ton of stack decks, most of them will be Flora's Gift and Lantador's Lost Love and other garbage. Um, but you're going to get your occasional Apothecaries and Seven Years Bad Luck and very valuable Div cards that will make you a lot of money. Um, currency. I don't need to explain why currency is good. Gems. Why are gems good? Gems offer you these boxes offer a lot of superior gems, sometimes level 20 or 21 gems, which, in fact, I personally don't pick up the level 20 gems. I have my item filter block those, but I do pick up the level 21 gems and try and sell them. And you also have a chance of getting a pretty hefty stack of GCPs. Um, there have been times when I go in a blueprint and there's two reward rooms with gems and I open all of those gem boxes and each of those gems has a stack of eight or nine GCPs and I walk out of the blueprint with 35 GCPs or something like that from the from four reward boxes of gems that happens um, not all of the gem boxes have GCPs but if you have a, a gem stash tab and I recommend actually Personally, I, I play a lot of heists, so I've got two gem stash tabs. I have one gem stash tab for things that I'm keeping or selling, and then I have one for just junk gems that come out of the gem boxes. And I, once they're full with 500 gems in them, or very close to 500 gems in them, I do the gem cutter recipe on all of them. I just pick all of those gems indiscriminately out of the, the gem tab and sell them all. And that's a good source of GCPs, such that the it takes time and maybe that's you know time is not worth it to you but it's very easy to do and the uh the gems that come out of these boxes even if you don't get gcps from the reward box itself are worth a couple of chaos in gcps alone gcp is worth more than a chaos um 
And so this is a, a really great source of getting GCPs. And one additional feature is that you need a lot of GCPs to run unusual gems and sell unusual gems. And that's the thing in Heist that has made me the most money. So it's a nice little synergy here that, that running contracts that provide gems, which is counter um, will also get you the GCPs that you need to make lots of money by selling unusual gems. All right, my ranking of heist assistants or rogues is going to be a little bit more simplistic. There's not as much stuff to talk about. Um, all of the heist assistants come with their own unique passive and differ only because of this passive. And there are only nine of them. So let's get into it. Um, I'm going to rank in the F tier, Huck. Huck's passive is that he is a powerful combatant that does more damage to enemies and gives you increased experience. Some people actually might like Huck because of the increased experience. Um, I don't think you should be leveling up in Heist. Leveling up in Heist actually is okay because it gets you a lot of currency, but if you primarily focus on leveling up, Heist is not really a very good way of doing it because... You're not trying to kill uh, many enemies. You're trying to get in and out and get currency, uh, get get rewarded for, for being in your heist. You're not trying to kill all of the enemies. Um, so I don't understand the point about Huck. Another, another point about Huck that's a, a, an unusual feature is that Huck doesn't have any level 5 jobs that he can do. Um, he could have a level 5 job that you, that you can do if you have highly theoretical heist gear, but nobody's going to do that. Um, at best, Huck is going to be able to do level 4 jobs if you put a, a, a more realistic piece of heist gear on Huck. Uh, it is not worth outfitting Huck. I, in fact, my in, in, in my hideout, I never bother with Huck at all. I don't give Huck any heist gear. I don't care. I never run Huck for anything. Um... But, you know, if you want to run Huck instead of some of the other worse heist assistants, feel free. Um, heist assistants that go in D tier. They're, these are assistants that really don't do anything. Isla is the uh, prime example of a heist his assistant that really doesn't do anything. Um, her passive is 50% increased time before lockdown. Big deal. Most of the time, because I'm lazy and want to get to to complete heists quickly, I don't try to open lots of boxes during lockdown. So there's really just no point to this passive. Another assistant that really doesn't do anything, at least in contracts, is Niles. Um, Niles has a feature where he only does deception and counter thaumaturgy jobs. And Gianna, who is a pretty good heist assistant, also does those those types of jobs. So unless you don't have the the requisite um, uh, heist gear in order to send Gianna on all of the counter thaumaturgy jobs, there's no reason that you'll ever run Niles in a contract because you're competing against the Gianna contract. Gianna's going to run those contracts instead. And it's not that hard to outfit Gianna so that she can run level 5 counter bomb jobs. In Blueprints, Niles is better than Gianna because Gianna doesn't get any, any reveals from running a Blueprint. And Niles gets to open one small box or big box. The, the, the Niles and Tibbs boxes that you open don't have to be a small box. They can also be a, a big reward room box, by the way. Quit asking for whatever this is. I'm going to do this trade.
he got his thing, so now maybe he'll stop he'll stop bugging me. Um shut up. Alright, so those are some assistants that don't do anything. Here, I'm going to surprise some of you and put an assistant that a lot of other people think is really good. I don't. Vindari is not a good assistant. Vindari has a 14% chance, assuming that, that Vindari's maximum job level is 5, he has a 14% chance to duplicate your uh, reward room contents. And he increases your alert level. I think he increases the alert level by 30% at level 5. And those things both go up. So if you increase Vindari's job level to 6 or 7, um, the, the chance to duplicate contents goes up. I think at level 6, it goes up from 14 to 16. And I think that the, uh, the chance... So the alert level increase goes up from 30 to 34. So you in, you keep on increasing your alert level. I do not like increasing my alert level. I would be much happier with this if it were a better than 14% chance to duplicate my rewards. Yes, that could be duplicating my Divine Orb. It's possible that it could be duplicating my Divine Orb. But it could also be duplicating garbage. And I won't be able to open as many boxes if I bring Vindari along. I do not bring Vindari in contracts at all. I do bring Vindari as a high priority on blueprints where you have three different assistants that you can be running that all have their own gear that all are contributing to the alert level reduction. Usually you're in blueprints, you're going to go open all of your high priority reward rooms because in blueprints you also have a measure of control over what reward rooms you're going to get from from the map um you, you you know in advance what those are and so you can you can go pick them and then when you're targeting specific reward room types that you care about then vendary is more useful because you'll be able to duplicate that as opposed to being being able to duplicate whatever and the whatever in contracts is for vendary's contract types which are demolition and trap disarmament and what is Vinjeri also have low level engineering? I think he does. But either way, uh, the, all of those contract types are not the best in terms of the rewards that they give. They do not give currency or divination or gem rewards. They give other stuff. So he's not going to duplicate in regular contracts the, the best rewards that you're trying to target. And he's just going to increase your alert level. And I don't, I, 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 I've played with this a lot and I've come to this conclusion and I'm happy to disagree with other people that say Vindiri is an S tier assistant. Vindiri is not good. I do not like running him at all. Um, I will run him on blueprints. I don't want to run him on contracts. I prefer running Isla on contracts for all of, all of Vindiri's jobs. All right. So that leaves these five assistants. The next assistant that's going to go is not going to go in in D tier. It's going to go in C, and this Tibbs. Tibbs does brute force and demolition, and I think Tibbs might be better if he didn't do brute force and demolition because brute force and demolition are not the best contract types. Um, Tibbs. Tibbs' um, passive is that he opens two boxes after lockdown. This is not bad. This is actually pretty decent, as long as those boxes are good. Um, I like opening the small boxes and picking up lots of, lots of stuff. I also like opening boxes that are good. Um, unfortunately, Tibbs' contract types are brute force and demolition demolition at least has a bunch of stuff that might be decent in it brute force doesn't the only thing in brute force that's even vaguely worth picking up that was on our on our tier list the only thing in brute force that was on the tier list that is not an f tier is fossils which is okay maybe you'll get lots of you'll get lucky and get lots of boxes of fossils but most of the time when i do brute force contrast i can open everything in the map because i skip everything that's not fossils in the in terms of the big reward rooms 
Um, so Tibbs bonus, not so bad. And I actually like running Tibbs in blueprints because you can open more of the, the, the large reward room boxes using Tibbs passive. Um, but overall, he's just going to go in C tier. Um, he has some really bad jobs to pick from. Now, Karst, Talina, and Nanette. Karst, Talina, and Nanette all have alert level reduction. Alert level reduction is good. I like having alert level reduction. I like being able to open everything in the map and, uh, and farming all of it in order to get as much currency as possible, in order to get as much chance as possible to open small boxes that might have uh, duplicated divine orbs or um, uh, chaos turned into divine orbs or regals turned into divine orbs. So I'm very happy with any of these three. Some people might think the Karst is significantly better. Karst's passive only apply of, of, of alert level reduction only applies to opening reward room boxes. It's true that Karst has some good reward room boxes in his contract types, which are lockpicking and agility. Uh, lockpicking has uh, both of these contract types actually can have currency boxes drop in them, so that's good. Um, but that being said. I, I value all of these three assistants pretty equally. All of them have alert level reduction, and that's good. Um, Karst's alert level reduction only applies to the large boxes. Nanette's and Talina's apply to both. Uh, Nanette, in addition to having an alert level reduction, has a completely worthless passive about scouting other enemies that it doesn't matter at all. Um, and Talina has an, a passive that will when you open the large reward boxes, will sometimes drop additional heist targets, which you can sell for rogue markers, which is, is pretty decent. Um, don't underestimate the, the usefulness of having the extra heist targets. Um, in exchange for this, Talina's alert level reduction is a little bit poorer than a Nanette's alert level reduction. But all of them for me are A tier. They're all quite good. And then Gianna, of course. Gianna, of course, is where it's at. Um, she will save you so many rogue markers in reveals. Every wing of a blueprint that you ever reveal should be from Gianna. Um, unless you were really just like trading lots of currency to get rogue markers, then you can use Wakano reveals if you really need to. Every blueprint that you ever can run as Gianna, you should. And um, Gianna is just just fantastic. But completely worthless in blueprints. There's literally no reason to run Gianna in blueprints. So these are the most important four rogues to outfit in um, in in a, any given league. Um, you should focus on these four rogues first. Then Tibbs, Isla, and Vinderi will be important to outfit. Niles is a bit. Niles competes with Gianna on all contracts. You'll never run Niles on contracts. So the only purpose of, of outfitting Niles is to run blueprints, which ideally, with infinite money and time, you should do. But if you don't get around to that, you're forgiven. And then Huck, I completely ignore. All right, so now having done those other rankings, we're ready to evaluate which are the best contract types in conjunction with knowing in which of these contract types, which assistance you can get, and which rewards the contract type offers. So, starting off in the F tier, by far the worst contract type is Brute Force. Brute Force, as I said before, has the worst reward options. The only reward in Brute Force that's not in the F tier is Fossils. In addition to Fossils, Brute Force drops weapons and uniques, both of which aren't worth opening at all. And the brute force jobs can occasionally be buggy. And there's just no redeeming feature to these contract types. Uh, the brute force uh, assistants are Tibbs and Huck. And Tibbs is the one that can get up to level five. There's no real reason to prefer Tibbs, especially because the reward room con reward rooms that you'll be able to open are just bad. So, Brute Force, the worst contract type. I never want to do this type of contract. In the D tier of contracts is Disarmament. Uh, disarmament can be done by Vinderi 
Isla and Talina. Um, so Talina is a good assistant compared to Vindari and Isla, which are not in doing contracts. The rewards for disarmament are currency, breach, abyss, legion, armor, weapons, and talismans. Um, these are not in order of likelihood. They're, in fact, uh, in order of most to least useful, roughly speaking. Um, there is a difference in, in the likelihood of which uh, certain contracts will give off certain reward boxes, I think. I'm not sure if I can prove that, um, but having run a lot of contracts, I think that some of these are more likely to appear in others. Anyway, in disarmament contracts, currency boxes are good, and then Legion and Breach maybe are passable, but definitely not priorities. And then there is Talisman Abyss, Armor, Weapons, really not, not a, a, a good assortment of reward types for for trap disarmament so trap disarmament goes in the d tier <clears throat> in c tier we have engineering which one of these is engineering that one <clears throat> uh, engineering has the reward types of maps random rewards uh essences and uniques so of these, a decent assortment of rewards. Uniques is bad, but every contract type has bad rewards. Um, one of the bigger problems is that the assistants are not very good. The engineering assistants are Isla, Vindari, and Huck. None of which inspire me. I don't want to really be taking any of those assistants. So for that reason, engineering... The rewards are okay. It goes into C tier. It's an okay contract. You can run these kinds of contracts uh, if you run all of your contracts. It's not completely a waste of time. Also in C tier, demolition. The assistants that do demolition are uh, Vindari and Tibbs. And I think Huck also does demolition. Um, the demolition rewards are Blight, Delirium, Metamorph and random. All of them are decent, but none of them are tremendously inspiring. I like the random and metamorph rewards the best. And there's another feature which just about demolition. Demolition is the most likely job to be buggy and to not have the animation uh, run correctly. And then I have to run around and, and make sure that Tibbs is far away from the the, the, the door that he's trying to open and then run back to it and try the job again so that it doesn't bug out. And that can be very annoying and slows down the job as well. So overall, decent rewards, uh, not the best assortment of, of assistance, and demolition goes in the C tier. Agility also goes in C tier. <clears throat> now the, the assistants that do agility are better uh, Kars and Talina are the assistants that do agility, and I'm happy to run both of those. The rewards, not so inspiring. Harbinger boxes, fossils, essences, and armor. You could make a case with these decent rewards and decent assistants that agility should go in B tier. And that's a fair case, but another feature that makes agility a little bit worse is the long animation time to run the agility jobs which does get tiresome so overall i demote it into c tier uh decent rewards decent assistance the jobs take a longer time to run and has multiple kinds of jobs that that take a long time to do the job you can uh, be risky and try and skip the, the the ones with the many lasers that you can run to run through um, but you might die. So, anyway, I put into C tier. I could see a case that it goes into B tier instead. <clears throat> we have four job types left. The next job type I'm going to place skips over B tier and goes into A tier, which is lockpicking. Lockpicking is done by Talina and Karst. Does Huck also do lockpicking? He might. I'm, I'm forgetting what Huck does because I never use Huck. Um, lockpicking has the reward types of currency, fragments, and jewelry. Currency is great, jewelry is not, fragments is okay. 
good reward types overall, good assistance overall, the job type doesn't have an animation that bugs out. Overall, just a good contract type. <clears throat> and then, it may not escape your notice that the remaining three contract types are Gianna contracts. I'm going to put Perception in the A tier. This is the only contract type that Gianna cannot do all of the jobs of. Um, actually, I think she can. She can, right? She can get up to level 3 Perception, but it requires a very theoretical piece of gear that has plus 2 to Perception in order for her to do the level 5 Perception jobs. Maybe, I, I forget. I forget if Gianna is level 2 or level 3 Perception normally. Um, I think she's actually level 2 Perception normally. I forget. Either way, uh, the, the reward types for Perception are Divination cards, Random Rewards, and Jewelry. So... Jewelry is bad, but overall, very good rewards for this, this tier. Uh, div cards, great. Random rewards, very good. And you get Gianna reveals for running these contracts. And, you know, the job is reasonably quick. It doesn't, it's it's like lock picking. Nothing, nothing notable to talk about this job bugging out or being slow. So, great contract type. Goes in the A tier. And then we have Deception and Counter Thaumaturgy. And I'm going to put both of these in S tier. And this is another thing where I think that not everybody, not everybody else, if somebody else were making this this guide, not everybody would be putting counter thaumaturgy up with deception in the S tier. Counter thaumaturgy has as reward types gems, currency, and jewelry, all great reward types. Uh, we talked about the gems reward type getting you a lot of GCPs. Um, both of these. These contract types give Gianna reveals. Deception reward types are divin divination cards, harbinger fragments, and armor. So armor bad, but overall both of them excellent reward types. The the deception rewards, uh, or sorry, the deception contracts are a little bit faster because you can uh, run through them at the end with there. There are no deception jobs that spawn after lockdown. There are counter thaumaturgy jobs that spawn after lockdown, and I think that many people really are annoyed by the the counter thaumaturgy floor job, and they don't like counter thaumaturgy for this reason, because they don't want to deal with the floor job. Uh, my advice to you is to deal with the floor job, because the counter thaumaturgy contracts give great rewards. There's also an, a tidbit about counter thaumaturgy jobs, which is the unique contract, Death to Darna is a counter thaumaturgy contract. The unique contracts allow you to open all of the reward boxes in the entire contract. So I like to run these except for the Slaver King, which is a brute force contract where all of the reward boxes are bad because they're they're all brute force reward contracts and it's just it's not even worth my time almost to run Slaver King. But all of the other unique contracts, if you have one of those trinkets that lets you get uh, Chaos Orb to drop his Divine or Regals to drop his Divines. Opening every reward box in a contract is great. And Death to Darna as a Counter Thaumaturgy level 4 contract can be run by Gianna. As long as you have a, uh, a piece of gear that gives either plus 1 to all jobs or plus 1 to Counter Thaumaturgy jobs for Gianna to run. And that's not so difficult. You should be able to get that piece of gear and you can run that unique contract. That contract, by the way, gives Gianna reveals. Um, so it's it's a good thing to farm. So th those are my uh, my assessments for, for the contract types. Connor Thaumaturgy and Deception, both outstanding contract types. I would run all of these. I would run all of these four at least. Counter Thaumaturgy, Deception, Lockpicking, and Perception, very good contract types. And if you want to, you can also run the contracts in C and D tier, uh, just for some variation, for some um, for some change of, of pace and the kinds of rewards you get. Uh, if you don't always want to get currency and divination rewards, sometimes you do want to farm some essences and fossils and things like that. And brute force contracts, uh, just put these away and don't run them unless you really need the rogue markers. They're a waste of your time more than any other contract type. So that brings me nicely into talking about another feature of running heist, which is the Atlas passive tree. 
Um, here's my Atlas passive tree that I'm running right now. Um, it has specced into Heist, obviously, but also Immortal Syndicate, Harvest, uh, Harbingers, Expedition, and uh, Blights. <clears throat> this is a, a, a tree that I just like to run. I change my tree up all the time to do different things. Um, this is just the thing that I happen to be running right at the moment. Also, uh, lab, Labyrinth Trials to get Gift of the Goddess. <clears throat> but let's talk about the heist nodes on the tree. I mean, this is one of the um, the main things that inspired me to make this video, is talking about the heist nodes on the tree. And we can talk about now one of these, th this heist node here, um, physical training, higher education, and the finer arts that lets you pick certain contract types. Now we talked about which are the good contract types and which are the less good contract types. So the small nodes for this cluster give you increased quantity of heist contracts found in your maps. Not bad. Um, the most important thing for you to optimize is blueprints because you're going to, if you run some maps, you'll get a ton of heist contracts, especially in 321 where heist is an option on the map uh, device to, to craft um, more contracts, which I've been doing almost all the time. And that guarantees you two more smugglers' caches and stacks with a chance to, to have additional smugglers' caches. So you'll get plenty of contracts. This doesn't give you increased chance to get blueprints. And that's the most important thing you can get from, from smugglers' caches is blueprints. And then the, uh, the notable nodes at the end of this cluster, physical training, higher education, and the finer arts, allow you to modify which contract types you get. But if you take the finer arts to get deception contracts like many people will tell you to do, you're also going to get agility and engineering contracts, both of which are in tier C. Maybe agility could be in tier B if you prefer. These other ones, demolition, counter thaumaturgy, and, and disarmament. Well, counter -thaum is great, and disarmament and demolition are kind of lame. Those are in tier D and tier C. And then here, this one, you can take lock picking, brute force, and perception. Lock picking and perception are both in tier A, but brute force is in tier F. Do you really want to take this one and then never get deception contracts and only get your Gianna reveals from, from the bulk of them coming from perception? My advice is to ignore this entire cluster, as you can see that I've done in my tree. I don't come anywhere near this cluster. This cluster, nothing in this cluster is valuable enough to take. Even if you're over here on the tree because you're doing ritual or something like that, still ignore this cluster. These four points are not worth your time. Um, put Spend these four points on something else in, and be willing to take any of these contract types because all of these, these three nodes make you take bad contract types in addition to good ones. And I don't really even have a preference of which one of these I would want. Um, deception or counter thaumaturgy or lockpicking and perception in addition to taking these other bad contracts. This is not, it's not worth it to me. Points on the Atlas tree are valuable enough. Save them and spend them on something else. Let's talk about the other uh, heist nodes in the Atlas tree. Um, no honor among thieves and casing the joint. These are outstanding nodes that you should always be taking if you are wanting to run heist. The small nodes here, your maps have additional chance to contain smugglers' caches and increased quantity of blueprints found in your maps. Both of them outstanding things that increase your chance of getting blueprints. Uh, no honor among thieves uh, basically gives you more smugglers' caches in your map. The smugglers' caches have increased the chance to contain blueprints. Awesome. Uh, they also drop more rogue markers. Okay, that's not a bad thing. And casing the joint, smugglers' caches have increased chance to drop blueprints, and the blueprints drop have a chance to be fully revealed. I'm not that concerned about whether the blueprints are fully revealed. This is just a nice bonus. I just want as many blueprints as possible. And this cluster gets you blueprints. So always be taking this cluster if you have any intention of running heists. And if you don't have intention of running heists, you can still take this cluster and sell your unusual gems blueprints, which will be worth a little bit of money. Uh, this cluster is very self-explanatory. Your maps have 
plus 12 percent chance to contain smugglers caches and the small nodes have uh your maps have plus four percent chance to contain smugglers cache um i like having smugglers caches and i like having blueprints and i like running ice so i take this cluster this cluster here the dutiful soldier very strange the small nodes have a uh, plus four chance to contain smugglers cache and as you can see I've optimized everything I can in my my tree, except for you know the one node here, which I didn't take, um, in order to to gain smugglers caches. And I'm over by this this node already. Um, the, the notable Huck accompanies you on opening the first smugglers cache in each of your maps. So Huck is there helping you kill monsters and granting you an experience buff. Why do you care about this? Do you really need Huck to help you kill monsters? I, I I don't see the value. It's true that you can force Huck to be there in the current uh state of uh in, in three three point twenty one where the map device allows you to force some smugglers caches, so there will always be at least one I think there will always be at least two smugglers caches um in in this circumstance. Um, but I, I just don't see the point. I don't see what, what, why, why you care about having Huck here. And there's one more node, and this node require, or this cluster requires some explanation. It's the Friends in High Places cluster. So the, the, the first of all, the first, um, small passive in the cluster gives you increased chance to contain smugglers caches, which is good. Uh, if you're right next to this, on this item quantity node, I would grab this. And some of my past trees have grabbed it, but I decided to spec out of essence and into some other things. So I wasn't taking this cluster amplified energies here. Uh, let me move this so you can see. Amplified energies. And um, so I don't bother taking this small node anymore. The other nodes, heist contracts found in your maps are 100% more likely to take require level three level four or level five jobs those are the small passives and you need to take at least one of them in order to take this node heist contracts are more likely to can to, to have targets that give you more rogue markers so this this cluster gives you more rogue markers and it also allows you to modify the level of jobs what does it do to modify the level of jobs in a contract it does two things. One thing is that it limits which heist assistants you can use to complete those jobs. For instance, Talina can be used to complete a level two trap disarmament job. But if that trap disarmament job is level five, Talina can't do it. No matter what gear Talina has, she could never do more than a level four trap disarmament job under any circumstances. The other thing that level that higher level jobs do is they increase the chance of reward rooms having two boxes instead of one. So the level five jobs have a high, the highest chance, which may be a hundred. I forget if that's true or not, of having two large boxes in the reward rooms. This doesn't affect the small boxes at all; only the large boxes in the reward rooms. So the, the the higher level jobs will have more loot because they'll have the same number of reward rooms with more boxes on average. So these two things are a double-edged sword. You want contracts with more loot, but you also want contracts with more flexibility. I recommend if you take this cluster to take the the least double-edged of these options and take the level three jobs, which will allow more of your better assistants, like Talina and Trap Disarmament, to go on more of the jobs, um, while also giving you a, a, a balance between the flexibility of running jobs with whichever assistant you like and the the rewards outputs from reward rooms and then take the notable if you feel like skipping this cluster then skip it it's not that important to to take the level three four and five jobs it's not that important in my view to gain more rogue markers you can get rogue markers by running more heists and when you if you want to farm currency and you have a trinket that that will allow your chaos or regals to transform into divines then 
you want to be running many heists. Um, so I would just run more heists instead of, of running more heists with rogue markers in order to try and farm as much divines as possible with these trinkets. Um, I would take this node to give me more chance to give smugglers caches. And I would I have taken this node uh, when I was running a, a, a similar tree to the run I'm running, running now a month or so ago, but with it, with essences instead of expedition and harbinger. I decided to alt to run expedition and harbinger instead. And when I was running essences, I took just this one node to increase the the, the high smugglers cache chance. Um, I could spend three nodes to go over here, but then I would have to take something out. Um, it's not really worth it to me to spend the travel nodes just to walk over here to pick up. 4% chance to, to have increased smugglers cash. Um, but it is something that I have considered doing just to optimize as much as possible my chance to get blueprints from my maps. All right, so let's talk about heist gear. Um, heist gear is a very important part of improving your efficiency at doing heists and the gear you only have a couple of priorities for each piece of gear and we'll talk about what you want to do and which pieces of gear the things that you need are on and also what are some very theoretical pieces of gear that you could get in heist so each heist assistant has four gear slots Gianna is probably the, the first heist assistant that you're going to want to gear out fast because you're going to use Gianna a lot. So they have a weapon. They have a brooch. Uh, the, the, the thing in the middle. I don't know what to call it. But the thing in the middle is the, is the, the only type of gear that is specific to, to certain types of jobs. So you can see this regicide desize kit that I have with Gianna uh, requires level 5 in deception. And that's a base level five. So Gianna will be the only assistant that could ever use a regicide disguise kit. And then there's a, a cloak. So on the, the, the middle item that's specific to which assistant you have, there is the opportunity to have plus one to level of all jobs in heists or plus one to level of a specific job. The, spe the, the specific job is going to be the... the the type of the item. So this is a deception item. It could also roll plus one to level of deception jobs. It could in theory roll both of these, but these are both very rare mods and they're both prefixes. So you cannot alt spam until you get both of these on it. You would have to regal spam or chaos spam or probably the more realistic thing, try to fracture one of those two on. Um, that's probably the most realistic way of actually getting it. But any gear that has plus two to a particular job type is very theoretical. I've never successfully made one. Um, I might hope to try to, to actually make one for my characters in standard. Uh, in league, it, it seems very difficult. And if you do manage to, to find one just by happenstance, you really have won the lottery. Although some of them, depending on which job it is, are going to be more, much more useful than others. Because for obvious reasons, people want to, to improve Gianna more than they want to improve, I don't know, Isla. Um, it's not very important, really, to improve Isla's job uh, jobs. But it is important for Gianna to be able to do as many jobs as possible and also to increase her highest job level so that her, her passive bonus of decreasing the cost of her reveals is as, as optimized as possible. This 35% reduced blueprint reveal cost actually turns out to be 45% because she's level 6. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> um, almost all of my it's not too hard to get on on this piece of gear the plus one to, to all jobs so all of my assistants have that which you can just get by alt spamming until you until you get that mod it's also possible to get job speed 
on this. I think that's the other important stat. Probably the most important stat is job speed, um, which is nice. I don't have it on this one. Not a big deal. Job speed also occurs on these cloaks. There's um, the most important stat on the cloak is reduced raising of alert level. But there's another stat that that can occur on the cloak that's very interesting. It's a very rare stat. So 12% is the highest amount of reduced alert level you can get. But there's also this stat, chance to not activate lockdown in Grand Heists, or in other words, in Blueprints, which allows you to take multiple of the end, uh, end state Blueprint rewards. I think that this would be quite good. As This is a quite good stat for running for Blueprints. I have it on Vendary here because I... Um, prioritize running Vendarian blueprints and not at all on other kinds of contracts. Um, I only have one of these right now. Ideally, I think you would have this on all of your your assistants that you bother to gear out. So, in other words, everybody other than Huck um, to optimize the chance of this. But that's going to be difficult because this is a very rare mod as well. And you also want to have reduced raising of alert level and possibly also job speed like I managed to get on this pe on, on this cloak here. Um, the, four, the, the chance to activate lockdown goes up to 5% at highest. So you can get up to 5%. So you could, in theory, have 15% chance to, to not activate lockdown in, in your blueprints. <clears throat> um, the brooches. Uh, the only thing that's important on your brooches is heist chance have increased chance to duplicate certain reward types. Um, and this can roll any kind of reward types. Um, I have picked currency and 15% chance is the, the highest amount of chance to duplicate that you can have. And if you have are, are running one of the trinkets that gives you um, chaos into divine orbs or regals into divine orbs, then you want as much chance as possible to duplicate basic currency because you would like to, to duplicate your divine drops if possible. <clears throat> um, it's important to give the brooches to different assistants that can actually drop that type of content. So here I'm looking at Vindari, and Vindari has Demolition and Disarmament, and he also has, a, as another stat, Heist Chests have a 10% chance to duplicate contained Breach Splinters. You're not going to get that many Breach Splinters anyway, but it's just a little bit of optimization. On Gianna, Gianna is probably the most important one to optimize. I also have I have currency, which is my priority, but then also a chance to drop contained divination cards. And Gianna has uh, perception and deception, which both have divination rewards. So just keep it, just try and keep in mind currency and divination are probably your biggest priorities for what you want. But if you get something in addition to that, then give it to somebody that actually open does contracts that opens that type of box as opposed to divination cards on Talina, for instance. No, Talina does have perception. On uh, Tibbs, for instance, where Tibbs is never going to run contract types that have divination rewards. That he might be able to duplicate divination cards in small boxes, but uh, optimize your chances of getting the most efficient rewards. And then the weapons. Um, the weapons increase the assistance uh, attack damage from making attacks or spell damage or whatever. Um, I don't care about the assistants doing damage in any way at all. Um, that's my job, not the assistant's job. So the important stats on the weapon are grants haste. If you're not already running haste, if you are running haste, you could pick a different aura and job speed. Those are the only things that you want is just to have job speed and, and haste. Uh, the, the highest level haste you can get is level 15. So here, this this precise arrowhead has job speed and level 15 haste, and that's the only stuff that I care about it. Uh, you have to pick the ranged weapon type, whether or not the heist assistant uses ranged weapons in order to get haste as a role. 
So because I don't actually care about the increased projectile attack damage from the item at all, I don't care if, if I'm giving this item to a character that can use the ranged the ranged attacks or not. I'm just it's just here for the haste and the job speed. The weapon is also the least important thing. I'd much rather have my drops be improved, my alert level be improved, and most important of all, the f increased flexibility of having being able to send the right assistant on the right job uh, to the to, uh, as much as I can. All of these things that can have job speed. Job speed is always a bonus, but it's just will improve how fast you have for heights. So if I have some other priorities, uh, I'll tend to be willing to take heist gear that doesn't have job speed. You're going to spend a lot of, of alts uh, crafting your own heist gear, which is probably still cheaper and, and simpler than trying to buy the heist gear, especially because not everybody plays heist in Path of Exile, and not everybody knows what what they're really looking for on heist gear. Um, some people will, of course, and some people might be willing to sell you that stuff, but you can also just uh, craft this stuff yourself. It shouldn't be that hard to get some of these things, like the, the, getting the haste is not that hard. Probably getting haste with job speed with, with alt spamming is not that hard. Definitely getting plus one to level of all jobs is not that hard. Getting a reduced alert level mod, even if you're focusing on a tier one, is not that hard. You may or may not get job speed with it. And I would suggest for, for people who are interested in running heist to craft their own heist gear themselves with with alt spamming. I think that about covers everything. Uh, have a terrible day.